Anyway, welcome to Jakarta for everyone that flew in. How many people flew in this, after, this morning? How many people drove down the road and took an hour to get here? <laughs> um, so what I wanted to share with you guys is, I thought I'd share with you guys, you know, we've been very, very fortunate to have been involved in building a lot of companies across the region. And I just finished a great tour with the iFlex leadership team where in the last four days, we were in Jordan, Dubai, Petra, um, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, and visiting great tech companies across the region. And, and what we saw time and time again were the very consistent traits that you find when you come across great tech companies at scale super, super fast. And what I wanted to do is share with you some of those today. <clears throat> so what I did is that I've been obsessed with building tech companies for a long, long time. And I actually got my mother to dig out a photo of me uh, in my very, very early days. And um, that's me, a long, long time ago. And, <laughs> what I, and what I wanted to demonstrate is that you can start with a really, really small idea. And you can take it really, really far, super, super fast. And that's one of the benefits of having the internet as your distribution platform. And if you look at this market in particular, the number of tech unicorns that have been created in the last three years, whether it's Gojek, Traveloka, Toko Peter, and so on and so forth, you know, these are companies that 10 years ago didn't even exist, and they're now bigger than some of the biggest companies in the country. So when you think about how to scale super, super fast, it's such a fascinating topic. And you know, it's not just limited to tech companies as well, it's also limited to cities. This is a photo of Jakarta from 200 years ago. This is actually kind of near where the airport is. Um, <clears throat> and it's so tremendous that how far Jakarta has come in 200 years compared to this great modern metropolis that it is today. So when you look at scaling companies and you look at the great companies being built today, I think one of the key stats that we really, really focus on is <clears throat> globally there's about 4,000 tech companies funded a year but only 15 of those companies take 85% of all the value created. In Southeast Asia, I did a very quick analysis this morning, there's about just under 1,000 tech companies funded here, so you read about all these great tech companies getting funding and so on and so forth. There's only about 10 of those companies take about 90% of the value. So when you really think about it, it's not just about starting a tech company and creating a lot of value. There, there actually is a specific science and specific characteristics between the 10 companies in Southeast Asia creating all the value or the 15 companies in the Silicon Valley that are taking most of the value. And what I've broken it down to is the five Ps to build a very, very disruptive business. So number one is, it sounds really obvious, but you've got to be really, really crystal clear what is the problem that you're trying to solve. A tech idea doesn't mean anything unless you're solving a massive problem for the consumers. You're making something cheaper, you're making something faster, you're making something more efficient. If you look at Grab and Uber and Gojek, they solved a massive problem. It was hard to get around. You didn't know what the price was. It was unreliable. It was untrackable. Now with one app, they've sold all of that, and they've sold it for every single person in the room. So you ask, why is Grab worth $6 billion? Why is Grab wor Gojek worth $3 billion? That's $9 billion US dollars created in Southeast Asia from companies that kind of do the same thing because they've solved a problem for every single person in this room. And not only is it for every single person in this room, it's a problem that you have every day. So it's a function of how many people are you solving a problem for and how frequently are you solving that problem. <clears throat> When you look at every unicorn created in the world, so this is every company worth north of US a billion dollars, you read about them in the press and say, your company XYZ is, is building a cool app to do A, B, and C. You just you ignore that and you dig deeper and there's always a massive problem that these companies are solving. And the bigger the problem you solve, the bigger the company you will create. The more often people use your app to solve their particular problem, the more valuable your company becomes. Number two, and this is probably the most important thing, and this is, if you look at the companies that are retaining and creating all of the value in the tech ecosystem, 
It's the intense passion that comes across from the founders, the financiers, the management team, and so on and so forth. And when you look at some of the two greatest tech entrepreneurs of the last decade, you would never describe any of these guys as being, oh, they're kind of quiet and lame and you know, not very enthusiastic. That You would never, ever describe them. They're both very intense, dedicated, passionate individuals who are just obsessed with solving the particular problem that they're focused on. <clears throat> it's been quite well known that if you talk to most successful VCs in the Valley and say, would you rather invest in the most passionate team you could find, or would you rather invest in the best business plan? And time and time again, the answer is, the companies that are successful are not the companies with the best business plan, it's the company with, or the teams with the most passion. So if you're sitting there all day writing your business plan over and over again, don't worry about that. Just get out there, launch your business, and bring as much passion as you can to solving your problem. And for me, it was something that, it was a personal statement that I wrote for myself several years ago when I was trying to understand, you know, why do I do what I do? Why do I get on a plane across six countries in five days um, <clears throat> and just work nonstop? And it was a personal statement where I concluded that I would rather work seven days a week for nothing but with people that I love spending time with on something that I'm really passionate for. And that's something that Elon Musk would say. That's something that Steve Jobs would say. And then if you look at people who are not building great disruptive companies, they're probably saying, I work five days a week for a lot of money with people that I don't really care about on projects that I don't really care about. So that's the difference between people who give all their passion to a project and people who don't. And you know what, in the end, that passion is directly related to how big the company is. The third thing that we've noticed is people. This is a very interesting photo. This is, um, this is a photo of Jack Ma, and these are the 17 co-founders of Alibaba. So you probably only mostly read about Jack Ma. Actually, if you go to the website, there's actually 17 people listed as co-founders. If you go to Forbes magazine, every single one of them is a billionaire. <clears throat> What's amazing is that they all lived in the same apartment for about two years when Alibaba was first, this is actually their apartment, and this is a photo that I pulled from the Alibaba website. But what it goes to show is <clears throat> that really point number two, and time and time again, science has proven this out, that companies with more than one founder perform significantly better than companies with one founder. <clears throat> So if you look at this as maybe the more co-founders you have, the better you'll do. But I think what it is, is it's getting a point that, you know, passion is contagious. If someone's passionate and you're in a great team with them, the more passion there is in your team and there's more problem people thinking about solving the problem, the greater your chances are of solving that problem in a great way. Here's another interesting point, number one, which I shared before, is that if you've got an amazing team with a not so amazing business plan, they always, always outperform a not-so-great team with an amazing business plan. So what it shows is it's never about the business plan. It's about the team. And the reason that is is because the amazing <clears throat> team will eventually iterate and evolve and change and twist until their business plan is the better business plan. Third one is 90% of game-changing ideas you look at a lot of the great companies, Google, Facebook, and you say, hey, where did you get the idea to come up with the news feed? Where did you get the, the idea to buy WhatsApp? Where did you get the idea to launch stories? Um, <clears throat> they'll say, the ideas never happen in working hours. They never happen in the office. It's usually outside of the office. It's usually over a drink. It's usually sitting on a plane. It's usually going to an event. And, and, that, and that's where, I guess, your mind is out of the day-to-day -day patterns that you're used to. And once you can get out of that, your brain can be a little bit more disruptive and say, hey, what if we did that? What if we tried that? What if we hired that person instead of that person? <clears throat> so it comes to the point that people are really key because if you have the right people, you can still win with not the right business plan. <clears throat> and lastly, if you have the right people and you spend time with those people, that's when your business evolves and iterates to become the business with the winning plan. Fourthly, 
So you've got a great problem that you're trying to solve. You're super passionate about solving it, and you build a great team. Then what do you do? You need to recognize that whatever plan you start with on day one is very, very likely going to be the wrong plan. And you need to build within the organization a culture of willing to change and willing to pivot. <clears throat> and you said that sometimes the CEO is not the chief executive officer. You're really the chief pivot officer. You're the one out front saying, if this doesn't work, let's try walking this way. Oh, you know what? I just realized this doesn't work. Let's try walking that way. And it's this ability to keep pivoting, this ability to experiment, the ability to test, the ability to keep trying again, the ability to take a chance, the ability to step outside your comfort zone, and the ability to do things differently from everyone else. And that's what creates the big, big, big disruptive tech companies. <clears throat> when you look at pivoting, <clears throat> you look at the great companies like Google, and they explain a little bit different. They recognize that every product that they launch could change, could pivot, could shut down, and could be totally killed at a moment's notice. And they tell the consumer up front. So if you actually look at Gmail, I think Gmail had crossed something like 500 million users globally. That's half a billion users. And inside Gmail, is still considered a beta product that wasn't necessarily ready, but they just threw it out and launched it to see what would happen. <clears throat> when you think about pivoting, you look at one of the largest companies in the world today, Apple, market cap, 700 billion US dollars. It'll probably be the first company in history to be worth a trillion US dollars. The funny thing is that if you look at who was Apple 15 years ago, the computer on the top left was responsible for 80% of their revenue and their profit. That product is now responsible for something like 2% of their revenue. <clears throat> and with Steve Jobs' ability to keep pivoting the product line, he said, we don't just need a computer. We need, we need a flat screen that you can carry around like a notebook. We need a phone. We need a better desktop. We need a better laptop. We need iTunes. You know, so, and it was his ability to keep realizing that every 18 months, I need to completely change my product set and come up with something bigger and better than the products that we had before. And if you think about it, <clears throat> that's probably one of the reasons why Apple will be the first trillion dollar company in the world. The last point, and if, it's, if there's only one point that you remember from this presentation this morning, is perseverance. And if you look, at, there's a great quote that Steve Jobs said. He says, I'm convinced that half of what separates the successful entrepreneurs from the non-successful entrepreneurs is basically that pure perseverance. It's just that ability to keep going and going and going. When you still don't even know why you're doing it, but you just keep going and going and going. And you're just focused on solving that really, really big problem that your company and your team are thinking about day and night. <clears throat> Next time you go to KFC, you look at the logo, and I love it because it's probably the only business in the world where their corporate logo is the cartoon of a 65-year-old man. And no media agency would have said, yep, this is the success to building a great chicken fast food chain. Let's just make the logo a really old looking dude. This is actually the founder of KFC and the founder of The Secret Recipe. And the reason why he's really old in the logo is he was about 65 years old before he finally found someone to invest in his company and open the first Kentucky Fried Chicken. And it's rumored that he spent about 30 years looking for funding before someone finally agreed to back him. And that was about a thousand and nine no's so if he had found funding earlier, you would have seen a younger dude in the logo, but that's a reminder that he was about 65 years old when he finally opened the first outlet. <clears throat> when I look at our own journey, a company that we're very fortunate to be proud of called iProperty, when we first tried to build that business, we said, we're going to solve a big problem. We're going to help everyone in Southeast Asia find a place to live. And about 74 people said, no, I don't believe it. I don't think it works. Asians are different. They know where they want to live. They'll use newspapers. We heard every excuse. But the, uh, just cut a long story short, it was 74 no's from investors before we finally found one investor who said, yes, I'll back this business. And ended up becoming a huge, successful business. But <clears throat> if we'd stopped after meeting 10, and by the way, most startups stop fundraising around meeting 10 or 15, and then they just give up. 
if we'd stopped after meeting 20 or meeting 30 or meeting 40, we wouldn't have built that business. So it was really the 75th meeting where the investor said yes, and then it all happened from there. And then we're really fortunate to be part of a business called iFlix, which you hear about right after this. And you know, we were really naive and thinking, oh, you know, we've built other tech businesses before. It'll be easy to raise money. Man, it was so tough. It was, um, it was about 115 no's before finally someone said, yes, I will invest in this business. <clears throat> and to make it even more complicated, that was the first round. Every round after that has also involved another 100 meetings. So we probably had four or 500 meetings. Probably Mark, my co-founder here from after this, we have probably spent more nights sleeping together on red eyes in the last three years flying around the world than I've spent at home in my own bed. Um, <clears throat> so in a nutshell, it really, really boils down to just find a really, really big, beautiful problem that you're super passionate to solve. Don't, don't try to solve a problem that you're not so passionate about because you're not going to work seven days a week. So find a big, big problem that you've identified and you think the internet can solve this problem. You're super passionate about solving it. Work with an absolute rock star team to solve that problem. And you know what? It's probably not going to work the first time or the second time or the third time or the fourth time or the fifth time. But if you've got an awesome team and you're all super, super committed to solving this problem, you'll eventually keep pivoting until you figure out what works. And if nothing else works, just have the perseverance to keep trying and trying and trying again. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a beautiful conference. <clears throat>